What is going on you guys and welcome back to the channel. Happy New Year everybody. This video officially marks my first video here in 2024 and I'm so excited to be back. I took a bit of time off uh, over the holidays to do some family dinners and some Christmas uh, you know, stuff. Nothing too exciting, but it was a nice, nice break, a nice little recharge of the batteries. And I hope you guys all had a really fantastic uh, break yourselves. I know going into 2024, I've set all these little personal, not even little, I've set these you know big uh, personal goals on the health side and um, you know fitness development side. Obviously, on the business side, I'm just really, really excited for what the new year has in store here on YouTube. Anywho, I'm glad that you're uh, with us here, uh, back for another year. I got a really good topic today. We're gonna to be covering the, you know, my my best or my favorite ideas for the upcoming year. And actually, rather than just giving like, you know, a couple stock picks, which I am gonna, you know, talk about here. I have stocks and ETFs that I'm liking. I've identified four pockets or four areas of the market that I'm liking. And I'm gonna provide the reasoning or justification as to why. And then I'd love to hear from you guys down in the comment section below whether you agree uh, or disagree, right? In fact, I actually was gonna request like at the end of the video, leave a comment uh, down below with like a number score. Like, do you agree with four out of four? Do you agree with three out of four? Uh, two out of four, one out of four? I'm hoping there's not too many zero out of fours because that would just be really sad. If that's, um, I'm, ho I'm hoping I'm able to point you guys in the right direction, at least areas that I'm liking. Um, and you know, these are keep in mind areas for me that I'm liking. They may not be suitable for you, but you can make that decision uh, as we go through. But with that said, let's dive in. Uh, leave a thumbs up if you like and uh, drop a comment down below. But area number one that I'm liking is non-tech in 2024. And to clarify, uh, you know, I just want to make sure I'm not like misleading anybody. I'm not suggesting that we go out and short all the, you know, the FANG stocks and all our favorite tech stocks, far from that. In fact, I still plan to hold some of my favorite tech stocks, but I personally can't help but look at the returns that we saw over the previous year, which was a solid year for the indexes. S&P was up, the NASDAQ, I believe, returned 40%. When you break that return down, a huge contributor of that index return came from the all-star performance from the Magnificent uh, Seven here, right? That's essentially what they're calling these grouping of stocks now. It's essentially the FANG stocks, but you know, there's a couple of inclusions. They kind of had to be included in these this all-star list, the NVIDIAs and Teslas of the world. Just take a look at some of these um, returns that we saw literally over just the past year. And no doubt these have been massive in propping up the, um, the index return. In fact, this, chart that I'm sharing with you guys. It's a little bit outdated, like September, but like you'll get the point. S&P's top seven stocks have soared more than you know X percent, while everything else is basically flat. Now, it didn't like finish flat. You still, you still did have good performers. But what, you know, when I look at this, what this, what just like is glaring to me is rather than, you know, chasing and, you know, just expecting that these stocks are going to continue flying, 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 I'm very grateful for you know the the great the returns. In fact, you know you guys know Meta was a really great you know performer for me. Uh, obviously, been a big holder of Alphabet and Amazon, um, Apple as well. Like you know, as a holder, you love to see this. But if I'm looking for stocks to buy into in the new year, what I'm saying is there might be other areas besides tech that I actually would personally prefer. In fact, one of the stocks I've been eyeing very much in the pharmaceutical space is Pfizer. Um, Pfizer, if you look at the share performance chart, it's done pretty much the exact opposite of, um, you know, these FANG stocks or the Magnificent Seven. This has been going down, down, down. It's been an area that I've been like and one that may be worth throwing on your radar. Another idea that you may want to look into is something like a Costco, right? Costco's just been steady, 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 but this is obviously in the food retailing space. Um, Home Depot, uh, Lowe's, you know, two stocks that just are always on the radar, great quality companies. You know, Home Depot I know is down a decent amount, um, Visa. I'm just trying to throw out suggestions to you guys that are non-tech because what happens is that a lot of investors, especially the new ones, they get drawn in and they get sucked in to what has recently done well. Again, it's not to say that they won't do well going forward and for another year, or not, they very well may. But personally for me, I am I am expanding my, you know, my horizon of what I'm looking at beyond there because my philosophy is I always like to buy stocks that are essentially, you know, you know, beaten down more so than chasing a, a stock that's done really well. 
one thing too that just is like worth mentioning is when you look at the S and P, the breakdown essentially of how big of a portion these um, you know seven magnificent stocks uh, represent. It's getting up there, right? It's up to like, what is that? 30% essentially, 25, 30%. And I believe this is slightly outdated as well. This is one of those things where when you are an individual stock investor, like one of the questions I always get is like individual stocks or ETFs. And you know, in many cases, ETFs for so many people is the right way to go. But one of the pros I believe of being an individual stock investor is that you now have like flexibility in times like these to be a little more calculated with where you deploy. If you are strictly an S&P 500 investor, you know, every time you invest in the S&P due to the nature of this index, the fact that it's market weighted and it essentially rewards these, you know, as these companies grow larger and larger and grow in market value, one may argue getting in a price range that is, let's say, overextended, let's just say, well, every dollar you put into the S&P, you're buying more and more and more of those. Whereas as a, an individual stock investor, you could have a little bit more um, flexibility, right? So anyways, that's just a fun point. I thought something to consider. I'm still going to own my tech stocks. I'm still going to gladly hold them, but might just be a something, something to consider, right? Is an outside non-tech exposure in 2024. Number two, which is actually a kind of a build off off that. And I actually want to credit and shout out one of my good friends, um, Joseph Hogue. I don't know if you guys follow him. He's from the States. So I don't blame you if you don't, but someone I've known for years and years and years on YouTube actually made a post over um, on Blossom. And as a big, big news alert for those watching who aren't Canadian, Blossom is now officially live in the US. So as of two days ago, we've had a huge uh, launch and undertaking expanding to you know all of North America. Well, Joseph Hogan made a, a phenomenal post here um, on the app, basically talking about this. And in particular, the fact that the small cap area, uh, the small cap you know market value stocks, might be a pocket worth considering. And actually prior to this post for the past six, maybe eight months, this has been kind of brewing on my mind as well. And this is coming from somebody who has never really put a good allocation towards small caps. It's just never been on my radar, never been something I've cared for and possibly, you know, a flaw on my end because I do, I think it's a very fair argument if you're looking at your overall asset pie or asset allocation to have an allocation to small caps, just in general, let's say during all market, you know, environments, let's say it's 5%, maybe 10% if you're a little more um, aggressive and okay with the volatility, assuming you can handle the ups and downs of small caps in general, it's actually not a, a terrible um, asset to hold by any stretch of the, the imagination. I remember actually looking at a bunch of index charts over the past number of years, and I'm always surprised at how well the small cap indexes do over long periods of time. It's just, of course, a much more bumpier ride. Anywho, um, why this is an area that I think is a, of interest is you're essentially playing you know, the interest rate cycle, and you're playing into these, uh, you know, the, the higher beta stocks. As we know, over the past you know couple of years, it's been really, really challenging for, let's say, more like sensitive stocks, right? If a stock has a higher beta, meaning it is essentially more volatile, you're going to see this a lot with the smaller cap stocks, maybe the less established stocks, uh, more riskier stocks, I guess you could call it. As interest rates climbed and climbed and climbed and the environment got uglier and uglier coming out of COVID and inflation is high, et cetera, et cetera, these stocks took a big, big, big um, beating right? A lot of the small cap meme stocks that you may hold, a lot of the penny stocks. Uh, it's just been a very challenging year for uh, pa past couple of years, honestly, for these companies. And that's completely logical because if you understand like the concept of, you know, flight to flight to quality, flight to safety, those terms are really interchangeable. What happens when the environment and, and the macro environment gets uglier and uglier and interest rates go higher and higher, it's more expensive to borrow and uh, ex more expensive to operate as a business and things just get ugly, A, it's extremely challenging for these companies that aren't as financially sound. Like a lot of times these smaller companies don't have billions of billions of dollars in reserves like a, like a Berkshire or like, a, like an Apple or, or for example, or Google. They're often like operationally way more sensitive to that. And secondarily, as an investor, these are the stocks that get hit first when the markets do take a turn for the worse, right? I've given this example before. But if you have like $100,000 in your portfolio and you need to access some and you have, you know, a stable bank stock that you plan to hold for your future retirement and you have more of like a fun, uh, aggressive small cap stock and you have a feeling or you start seeing the market start to take a turn for the worse, 
you're gonna pull from this um, smaller cap stock. Like they are just more sensitive. That's just the fact of the matter. Um, that's very logical. And then when you have millions and millions of investors doing that, there's a reason that these stocks, you know, do drop harder when, you know, times are ugly. They are higher beta stocks, meaning they're more volatile, more sensitive to the moves in the market. Well, when the tides turn, and I'm not suggesting that I believe, you know, all of a sudden 2024 is gonna be a phenomenal year. That's not what I'm saying. But we have started to hear like inklings, um, you know, hinting at, let's say the potential for some interest rate cuts. Now, whether that's gonna happen, uh, who knows? Uh, we, you know, I've learned never to trust these uh, people, but um, certainly when those cuts come, and let's say the, the sentiment in the market tends to you know, pick back up, I would say another thing that's very much keep, worth keeping in mind is that 2024 is uh, an election year, which is always interesting years for the market, but uh, you, you tend to believe that you know, whoever's you know, wanting to gather all the votes uh, for the election, you know, they're gonna do what they can to like, you know, prop things up and uh, make things a little bit like less gloomy. You'd think, right? Um, there are a couple of potential catalysts in the new year that could work in favor uh, for just the broader market in general. And if that is the case, um, when that tide starts to turn, it is a very fair argument to, be, argument to be made that being in a higher beta stock or small cap stocks, which actually move, you know, let's say double or triple to what the market would typically do, well, of course, then you're actually gonna participate on more upside, right? So a very, very, very fair consideration there. In my opinion, like how I would go about this personally is I don't feel comfortable in my abilities to go out and research like small cap stocks. In fact, pretty much every small cap stock I feel I've ever bought in um, has not worked out for me. And I'm sure you guys could probably think a couple on the channel over the years of, you know, these fun flyer stocks that you that I try buying and they just end up sucking. Um, it's different when you're investing in, let's say like, uh, you know, an established blue chip, you know, well, I have a system and I have a process and the resources and tools to help me come to like an informed decision with a small cap stock. I'm just not as confident in my skills, right? There's usually not as much data out there, like in terms of financial history, you gotta approach them differently. I'm saying for me, I wouldn't be going out and picking a bunch individually, but maybe you could play this entire field in aggregate by buying, let's say an ETF um, that tracks uh, a small cap index, right? Maybe something like a Russell 2000 uh, index. You can do some research on, um, on what would be maybe a suitable option for you. But I think that's, a, again, possibly a very fair consideration. I'm hopefully, I'm hopefully two for two right now. And again, keep in mind, I'd love to hear your, what, what you're thinking down below if you guys agree or disagree. But um, moving on to number three, this is one that I know you guys aren't gonna agree with and like rightfully so, fairly so. Um, this is probably my first one, well, hopefully, the first one you guys don't like, but I am thinking um, Chinese market. The Chinese market is due. And I know that I've been saying this now for two and a half years, essentially. And I've been burned by this. You know, if you guys as well were, you know, went out and, and bought into these Chinese stocks, We've all been burned. Uh, my portfolio, if you look at essentially, you know, what's been dragging it down, it is my Baba and Tencent uh, positions that I was so optimistic for and so, you know, bullish on. Uh, and I, if you recall, like back when I bought my townhouse um, and I sold off my TFSA, et cetera, I like made these, I bumped these stocks up, taking a big, big bet on this market. And clearly like, you know, big lesson for me is like, you know, I swung for the fences and then it ended up uh, striking out, right? Big time. It sucks. That said, maybe I'm just being stubborn, but I'm not ready to, to throw in the towel just yet. And uh, without a doubt, there has been more negative news even just in the past week um, with more government intervention. I know there was a, another regulation that came in regarding, regarding video games, right? Um, and the sale of... Uh, uh, monetization on video games, obviously a big negative for Tencent, one of my stocks, which is huge in the video game space. These risks are all still there. Uh, the government risk is still there. There's a risk of, um, you know, uh, war, which we keep hearing about more and more and more, uh, invasion, yeah, yeah, yeah. That'll always be there. And again, I look at everything for me, I'm willing to take those uh, risks. On a positive note, we have seen like uh, Huawei, the, the you know the phone company, they actually just reported very positive numbers. Alibaba has been buying back shares and they're going to be buying back shares. As a long-term investor, this is typically a very positive sign to me when I see you know the company willing to take their capital and buy back their shares. 
the question I ask myself and I ask myself this with any investment, but especially these, you know, two in my portfolio is like stripping out everything that's happened in the past, right? Like, let's just forget what's happened, uh, you know, in the past year, two years in my performance at these levels, are these something that I would want to buy? Is it a company that I would want to hold? The only reason you wouldn't do this is if you could do tax loss harvesting and then you actually do need to factor in your losses. But uh, I, I, don't, I hold these in my TFSA, so I can't. But I ask myself, would I want to own these shares at these levels today? And for me personally, the answer is yes. Therefore, I will continue to hold them. And there's maybe a world in which these never realize because of... Uh, because of all the various reasons as to why they're priced so low. I think these are actually very, very big and um, promising businesses. And again, I'm extremely bullish long-term over the next decade on uh, China as an economy. Obviously, they're going through a slump right now. Like as with any economy, they go through their good times and bad times. Certainly a lot of stuff to uh, worry about there. But I just do think that um, over the next decade, um, China will continue to grow, India will continue to grow, and you know these two big, big companies in there will actually uh, benefit. You know, there's like it's very similar to if if you you know were following Meta over the past like year and a bit, right? I remember the sentiment around Meta was extremely negative when people were talking about how the stock is dead and how they're blowing all this money on the metaverse and whatnot, and it feels like in just like a snap of your fingers, like very, very fast, that sentiment flipped. And all of a sudden they're up, you know, 200%, 150%, 200%, right? Like that seemed to have happened overnight. I foresee this happening as well. The possibility of this happening with these Asian stocks is very fast. If there are a catalyst, whether it's a, you know, a new government or some sort of positive deal uh, with, um, you know, the two nations, because of how volatile these, these markets are, when things start to run, they can run fast. And I just think these levels, they're at de uh, depressed levels uh, personally that are, are worth considering. So again, you don't have to agree. In fact, fairly disagree down in the comment section below. You, you can let me know because you guys have been right on this one, uh, not me. But um, anywho, last number four, um, last pocket of, of area that I like, fixed income, okay? Uh, and fixed income, you know, again, when I talk about fixed income, Never in my life have I gone out and bought, bought you know, an individual bond. Um, I just never have. I know it is still possible, but I think it's just very uncommon. What I'm talking about here is more so uh, probably playing it through an ETF. In my portfolio right now, I own two bond ETFs. So uh, a high yield bond fund, so XHY, as well as TLT. And I think uh, you know, TLT has actually done quite well, up about 20%. Uh, XHY is, you know, I don't think up too much, up 5%. Keep in mind, these are excluding dividends, right? These are actually just the share, you know, the share price going up for a bond fund. Obviously with the rates, you know, where they are today, that just flat out makes, um, you know, these these bond funds more attractive, right? They're just a more viable investment than they were, you know, three, four years ago when they were paying like one and a half percent, two percent, and you can go buy a dividend that's gonna pay you more. Well, now for a lot of investors, especially those in their middle ages, if you're getting a little bit older, to take a, a safer or more conservative asset like this and pull in a relatively secure rate, rate like this, to me, it's a very, very logical thing to do. As well, um, on the topic of, of interest rates, and again, we hinted on earlier that there's the possibility of rates you know, coming down, potentially up to three cuts next year, who knows? The fixed income market, that, that would in theory be a positive for the uh, bond market and for the fixing for for our bond holdings if the rates came down and essentially the logic behind that is you know let's assume i can go out and buy a bond you know today right and this bond is paying me like a five percent coupon or a five percent interest rate let's just say maybe it's six maybe it's, let's just say five well if rates come down as you know some people are expecting and these new bonds are being issued at you know lower and lower rates, right? All these new bonds that are being issued are, are now at a 4% yield or a 4% coupon, a 3% coupon, et cetera, et cetera. My bond that's paying 5% actually becomes more attractive. It actually ends up you know trading at a premium, right? Because the price of the bond varies as well. There's like an inverse uh, correlation, right? When interest rates go down, the price of all these existing bonds go up. So there's a fair argument, if you believe that is the case, to hold these. And again, it's not like we have to count on this. What I'm saying is there's already a strong baseline. And I guess more so the question to ask yourself is from these levels, do you think it's more likely interest rates go up or more likely they go down? 
and maybe they stay flat, who knows? But in my opinion, there's probably more of a chance of them staying flat slash, you know, trickling down, which would be uh, favorable for these types of investments. So, like I said, I mean, those are just like four areas that I'm liking for me. And I'll ask for you now, of those four, you know, now that I've kind of explained as the reasoning as to why, leave a comment down below as to whether you agree, whether you disagree, and how many of those you um, agree with. I'm hoping we get some like solid threes out of fours, uh, fours out of fours. I totally understand if no one wants to uh, like uh, be stubborn on this uh, Chinese holdings with me, that's totally fair. Um, but like I said, hopefully not too many ones or twos out of fours. That's just what I've been liking, right? And do please do leave down in the comment section below, maybe some areas that I'm overlooking or areas that might be attractive. Maybe it's something like crypto. I don't know, not for me. Um, maybe it's real estate, maybe it's REITs. Um, what areas are you guys liking? Leave a comment down below so our other viewers can go uh, and learn from you guys as well. If you enjoyed today's video, please do give it a thumbs up. It's been a while since I filmed the video. It just feels so like, uh, I feel rusty, you know, I feel, I feel rusty, which means I gotta get back into the rhythm of doing this more. And I'm very excited to do so. I have actually a bunch of video ideas for 2024, but as well, if there's any suggestions that you guys would like me to um, cover, leave that down below um, because I will add those, you know, I'll read them and then add them to my list, whether I get to them right away or not. But it's been, uh, it's been super busy in all honesty um, between, you know, this, YouTube, the Academy, uh, my Instagram and, and Blossom obviously is just like really a full-time thing at this point. Um, I'm trying my best to do all of this um, and, and keep everything running. But I know you guys are enjoying so much Mark's uh, content and the news, like, man, such a great way to stay up to date. And uh, for those of you tuning in, you know, video after video, super, super, super cool guys. And thank you for the support over these years. You know, we've now been doing YouTube from 2017. 2017 is when we started this channel, actually technically 2016. And now it's already uh, 2024. It's crazy how time flies. But uh, for those of you that have been riding with us, thank you so much. For those that are new to the channel, you know, welcome. I hit that subscribe button. And uh, yeah, lastly, like I said, Blossom is now uh, available in the States. So obviously if you're in Canada, you should be on there anyways. It's a free app and we've grown to 80,000 users here in Canada over the past year, pretty much. Well, if you're a US viewer watching this, um, go to the app store, click the link down below. You can easily find it, Blossom Social. And uh, we'd love to see what see and hear what you think of the platform. You can leave a comment down below. Always open to feedback. But uh, that's it for today's video. As always, I thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed. And I'll see you in the next video.